four, Good afternoon, and welcome to the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine SAM20 virtual meeting. I am Dr. Jim Holmes, SAM president. For those of you joining us for the first time, SAM is the premier international organization representing researchers and educators in emergency medicine. In our work, SAM promotes and facilitates scientific discovery, educational innovation, and the professional and leadership development of our members. Today, we are proud to bring you the COVID-19 keynote address entitled, Emergency Physicians and Public Health Providers, The New Pandemicist. During the presentation and during our question and answer session, you will hear from Dr. Lena Wynn, visiting professor of health policy and management at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, where she is also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Wynn was the former health commissioner for the city of Baltimore and a frequent commentator on CNN, MSNBC, and BBC. She will share her knowledge and views both from public health and emergency medicine perspectives on the COVID-19 pandemic, providing along the way guidance and insight that will likely prove invaluable to the rest of us as we care for our patients in our own communities. During the presentation, you may submit questions for the presenters by clicking the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. Questions that are upvoted will be prioritized during our questions and answer session to start immediately after Dr. Wynn's presentation has concluded. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rich Rothman, SAM's COVID planning chair to provide the opening remarks for today. Dr. Rothman is the executive vice chair in the Department of Emergency Medicine and professor of emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins Medicine. His research program focuses on the interface of emergency episodic care and infectious disease surveillance, diagnosis, and treatment with research on varied commonly occurring ED conditions, including pneumonia, skin and soft tissue infections, sepsis, HIV, STDs, influenza, and now COVID. He has particular expertise in development, translational, translation of rapid and no novel molecular diagnostics. At Johns Hopkins, he works with an interdisciplinary research team, which includes investigators from emergency medicine, microbiology, infectious disease, and public health. Currently, Dr. Rothman serves as principal investigator and co-director for the NIH, NIAID Center of Excellence for Influenza Surveillance and Research, as well as a lead on a BARDA Health and Human Subjects Cooperative Agreement to study new approaches to advanced therapeutic trials for pandemic response. Dr. Rothman was also one of the founding members of the SAM MTI Group, a national network of academic emergency departments focused on research, practice, and policy related to emerging and transmissible infectious disease. Welcome to you, and thank you for being here, Dr. Rothman. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, and thank you to SAM for hosting today's keynote address. As Dr. Holmes mentioned, our keynote address is Dr. Lena Wen, who's a visiting professor of health policy and management at George Washington University Milken Institute of Public Health. She's also a distinguished fellow at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity. Previously, as Dr. Holmes mentioned, Dr. Wen served as commissioner of health for the city of Baltimore, as, as well as the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood. In 2019, Dr. Wen was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and as Modern Healthcare's 50 Most Influential Clinical Executives. Dr. Wen earned her medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine and her master's degree at the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. She then completed residency training in emergency medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and at Mass General Hospital. 
She's the author of a do dozens of scientific articles and has been an op-ed contributor to the Washington Post, National Public Radio, and the Baltimore Sun. She's also regularly featured on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, BBC, and PBS. Today, Dr. Wen will be sharing her perspectives from the vantage of a practicing emergency physician and a public health leader during the current pandemic. Wonderful, thank you so much. And um, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am really honored to be here today to be invited to keynote um, today's session at SAM and especially during this time this year. And I first had a conversation with Dr. Jim Holmes and Ian Martin um, a, a couple months ago about this talk. And I remember them both saying, we've never been prouder to be emergency physicians than right now, that we've always known about how important our work is and now the world sees what it is that we do. And I think COVID-19 has brought our work and the importance of it um, and the importance of being frontline providers to the public. And I am really grateful that others can see the tremendous efforts that all of you put in now and every day and also the sacrifices that you make in service to our patients. And so I'd like to begin today by first thanking our president, Dr. Jim Holmes, our immediate past president, Dr. Ian Martin, the entire SAEM board of directors and staff, of course, Dr. Rich Rockman as well for your work in partnership, um, certainly here in Baltimore. Um, and I wanna thank all of you. I remember attending my first SAEM conference as a resident, and I've always appreciated the work of academic emergency medicine. And I can't tell you what a great honor it is to be back with you, to be with the people that I train with and learn from, um, those who are involved in training the next generation, and those also who are in the next generation too. I have the utmost respect for the work that all of you do. So the title of my presentation is emergency medicine or uh, is um, uh, emergency physicians and public health providers, the new pandemicist. And I think we can go to the next slide, which shows this. Um, and the what this highlights um, is that COVID-19 is this intersection of the two fields that have been a part of my life and many of our careers, which is these two fields of emergency medicine and public health. And by the way, in case you're wondering about what all my slides are going to look like, they will all look like this. I have eight of them um, in total with very brief words and no pictures on them. So hopefully we can keep you entertained through Zoom. Um, but, you know, I wanted to start with this um, intersection because I went into emergency medicine, I think for many of the reasons that we all did. You know, for me coming as an immigrant to, to the US, and growing up in underserved areas, I never wanted to be in a position where as a physician, I would ever have to turn anyone away because of ability to pay, because of where people came from. But it was also in the ED that I realized the limitations of our work as well. I remember this one patient in particular who I kept on seeing over and over again. And all of you know, these patients, these patients who come in so many times that we can recite their CBC. We know um, what their last CT scan showed because we were the ones that performed it just a couple of days ago. And this was a woman who came in day after day seeking help for her addiction. She was only in her 30s, but she certainly seemed much older. We all knew that what she needed was help for her addiction. And yet we also knew that by the time we called the social worker, by the time the social worker called around looking for beds, the soonest she might be able to get in anywhere was possibly in a couple, was at best a couple of weeks, maybe even longer. Sometimes this patient would lie to us and say that she was suicidal, even though she wasn't, because she knew that it would buy her some additional time for us to call a psych consult. And I always thought about how tragic it is that our patients feel like they have to lie to get the care that they desperately need. In any case, I remember this patient coming in one last time she came in that morning and we referred her to see, um, to see someone as an outpatient and found her an appointment in a few weeks time. And then she came in on my same shift and this time she had overdosed and we were unable to resuscitate her and she died. And I remember all of us looking into her chart and counting the number of visits that she had had in our ED. And over the course of a couple of years, it was over a hundred times that she had been to see us in the ED and our system had failed her time after time until it eventually cost her her life. 
I think all of us can tell stories like that of how, despite our best intentions, our system is what's failing us. And as much as we want to help patients in the setting of the ED, there's something much bigger that's at play. And that's, it's for that reason that I went into public health, thinking that it might be a way for me to influence that broader system. Um, and so I ended up having my dream job, as you heard from, uh, from Dr. Rothman, Dr. Holmes, which was that I led the Baltimore City Health Department as the commissioner there for four years. And in that role, actually, I also saw the integral role of emergency medicine, because, for example, I saw how much there are policies that sound really good on paper, but when it comes to actually what's implemented on the front lines for our patients, that's often where it falls apart. And I'll give you some, some examples of this too. And I think it's actually working in public health too that I gained an even greater appreciation of the work that we do in emergency medicine. That for us as emergency physicians, we are the front lines in so many ways, the front lines of patients coming in. We're also the front lines of seeing the problems, these systemic challenges that we face. Um, and we're also incidentally, the first ones to see problems coming to that are um, that are the pandemics. In the case of COVID-19, it was the frontline physicians in China, in Italy, and here in the US too, who are sounding the alarm about this new virus and about the devastating effects um, and harm that it can cause. And so I just have such a deep appreciation for the work that emergency medicine and public health do hand in hand. And so what I wanna do in this talk, um, the next slide, is I want to go over five lessons from the front lines that I learned drawing upon the experiences in emergency and public health, particularly focusing on this time of crisis for our country. So lesson number one in the next slide is that we should do what we can now. Now, those of us in emergency medicine know that we do not have the luxury of time or hindsight that a patient comes in an extremis, we may have extremely limited information, but we have to act now. We have imperfect information, but if we don't act now, waiting and doing nothing, of course, is a decision and an action too. It's always easy, I think, to be on the other side of this and to look at the decisions that we made and to second guess that decision, but we do the best that we can. But as much of a challenge as this is, this is also what we're good at. I wanna give you the example of public health too, that this is also the same lesson that we can apply in public health. When I first started my job in Baltimore, um, when I was first appointed was December of 2014. And we were facing an escalating number of deaths from overdose, from opioid overdose at that time. And I turned to my team and we brainstormed and we worked with our partners to think about what it is that we can do. I mean, stopping overdose and treating addiction is a complex problem. And so many people came up with these multi-pronged, um, multi-system solutions that yes, they are important, but we also cannot wait for all these things to occur. So what we did was to say, let's start with what is in our control right now. And what was in our control was naloxone, Narcan, which all of us have worked with so many different times. I mean, working in the ED, I've resuscitated patients as all of us have with Narcan many times and have seen how someone who would otherwise be dead would be walking and talking within seconds of getting this medication. And so in the wake of escalating numbers of people dying, we worked with the state legislature and within a few months actually got the state legislature to allow me to issue a blanket prescription for naloxone to every single resident in our city. Now, I knew this was the right thing to do, but I will say that writing your MPI number, printing your MPI number and signature on 620,000 prescriptions was something that, that did um, give me a little bit of anxiety, but that was an important first step. We were able to get that blanket prescription out so that essentially naloxone became over the counter. And this was back in mid 2015. We also ended up training the trainers. We trained community organizations. We deployed people on our needle exchange vans and community health workers. And within three years had done nearly 30,000 trainings. And by the time I left my job in Baltimore four years later, everyday residents had saved over 3,000 lives of fellow residents in our city. Now I talk about this because of course there were other things that we ended up doing too. We also ended up having a hub and spoke model 
for addiction treatment. We started a stabilization center, which is the beginning of a 24 seven ER for addiction and mental health. That was actually a pre-hospital diversion from the ED for patients who needed addiction and mental, uh, and mental health support. We were able to do all of these things in time, but we also had to start somewhere. Perfect cannot be the enemy of the good and often waiting is not an option. That's what we know from emergency medicine, and I think is a lesson that's deeply embedded for us in public health too. That you do, sometimes you do want to wait for all these factors to converge. And I think in public health as well, you look at the social determinants of health. Um, you know that so many different factors also affect how long someone lives, how well someone lives. I mean, all these are important to address in time, but I also strongly believe that we need to find the intervention that's in our power and do what we can now. And I think that these are the same lessons that we see in the COVID-19 crisis as well, that we've seen when patients come into our EDs that we roll up our sleeves and we treat them. We don't know what the ideal treatment is when this first started, this is a new virus, how would we know? But we know our training, we do the best that we can and we do our part to take action and do it now. Now that said, and I'll go on to lesson number two, it doesn't mean that we stop. Lesson number two is that we still evaluate, innovate, and improve constantly. Again, I think this is second nature to all of us in emergency medicine, but maybe needs to be spelled out to those who are not familiar with our field, but we've seen this with COVID as well. We start somewhere and we treat our patients with the best information that we have at the time, but we're constantly evaluating as well. We're constantly looking for new treatments. The idea that patients can be um, can get better oxygenation prone, for example, or that patients with COVID can tolerate lower oxygen saturation, and we will not need to in, to intubate them to intubate some patients who can do just as well or even better. I mean, these are all things that we've just come up with in the last couple of months. But I look to the ingenuity and the um, and the curiosity. Think of emergency physicians and the willingness to try new things as the reason why we've been successful thus far in combating this crisis. I think we emergency medicine, given our training, we're comfortable with not knowing and trying and improving. And actually that change, as uncomfortable as it is for many other people, we know is important. And in fact, is the bedrock of emergency response and good public health practice to be able to look at what we're doing and adjusting accordingly. I'll give you an example from our time in Baltimore as well. There was a program in our city called Be More for Healthy Babies that aimed to reduce infant mortality and was a, um, um, was a public private partnership involving over 150 hospitals, community groups, religious groups, and, and others that aimed at one goal, which is to reduce infant mortality. Well, you all know about infant safe sleep, that infants should be put to sleep um, alone in a, uh, in a bed, um, on their back, um, or sorry, alone, on the back in a crib, um, don't smoke, no exceptions. I have an infant right now and I think it's lack of sleep that's making me mix up my ABCs of safe sleep myself, but um, ABCs of safe sleep, alone, the back in a crib, don't smoke, no exceptions. And we taught the ABCs of safe sleep and had all these community health workers also visit people in their homes, social workers visit uh, moms in their homes um, and even hand out free cribs. What we were finding though was that still there were many infants that were not abiding or that were not conforming to the ABCs of safe sleep practice. And in fact, um, there were still um, infant deaths as a result of unsafe sleep practices. And so we sent our community health workers to visit um, women in their homes and see what's going on. And what we found was that so often the babies were still sleeping on a couch, co-sleeping, et cetera, in other unsafe environments. And so we asked what's going on because we're giving out these free cribs. Well, it turns out that when the home visitors went to the homes, they found that the cribs were still in a flat pack and never opened. And the reason was that many of the families did not have the tools or knew how to assemble the crib. Now that was something that was actually an easy intervention once we figured out the cause. Because then in addition to sending the free crib, we could send someone out there at a time when we could do home visits safely, but we could send people out there into people's homes to make the crib. And that was a simple intervention that ended up resulting in a huge, um, uh, huge change in behavior only because we knew about the importance of constant reevaluation. 
And by the way, as a result of teaching the ABCs of safe sleep, as a result of all these home visiting practices of ensuring in our city that every pregnant woman who is on Medicaid ends up getting triage to levels of care and they would get a home visitor, a nurse, a social worker, et cetera, to visit them in their homes during their pregnancy and postpartum. As a result of all these interventions, we were able to reduce the infant mortality in our city by 38% over the course of seven years. And we also closed the disparity between black and white infant mortality in our city by over 50%. But again, only able to do that because of constant reevaluation. I think this brings up another point in, um, in this lesson as well, that a policy alone is not enough. We need practical intervention as well and practical implementation as well. When I talked about the naloxone policy, it wouldn't have been any good if I just issued a standing order, but no one knew about it. We also had to be aggressive about educating people in our city about naloxone, doing the trainings, meeting people where they are. We went to uh, bus shelters, we went to, um, to housing units, we went to restaurants and bars to teach people about it. Because if you don't know about it, if the pharmacies aren't stocking naloxone, I also hired someone whose sole job it was to go to pharmacies and talk to pharmacists about making sure to stock different formulations of naloxone and fulfill these prescriptions. Um, it, without that practical on the ground work implementation, the policy alone is not enough. And I think that, again, is a lesson about the importance of constantly evaluating, innovating, and improving. Lesson number three to the next slide is that we also draw upon our training. A few months after I started in my job in Baltimore was um, the death of Freddie Gray, an unarmed African-American man who died while in police custody. And then right after that, there were riots that erupted across Baltimore. Um, I was one of the leads in our city as the head of an agency. I was one of the leads on handling civil unrest. And you know what? There is no playbook for what you should do. What is the public health measure um, that you implement in the case of civil unrest? But my team, we knew what to do. I had an exceptional team then, including Dr. Jonay Khaldun, another emergency physician who is now the health director um, in the state of Michigan. And she and I and our team, um, we knew what, how we would handle things as emergency physicians. We knew about triage, for example, that life-saving issues have to come first. And so while we saw all these images of burning cars and people throwing bricks, and there was fear about really not being able to get people to care, we knew that our priority had to be getting people to hospitals. It had to be working with our local hospitals to ensure that staff could get there safely, that patients could get there safely, that ambulances still have a, um, have, a, uh, have a route to follow to pick up patients to go to the hospitals. We then had to figure out in the days to come what happened with patients who are on chemotherapy and dialysis. When their clinics closed, how could we get these patients who had urgent treatments to get their care? We followed protocols. We drill for this purpose. We understand our incident command structure. We practice this. We know what to do. We also understand the importance of clear communication, just as when there is a patient who's coding in a case where there is a city that's in crisis. We also understood that there has to be one point of contact, one central command structure, and that there is no such thing as over communicating. In those first initial hours, we actually had hourly calls with all of our hospital partners and then turn, tuned it down to every four hours, every 12 hours, et cetera. But that's what we had to do. There, again, no such thing as over communicating in these times. We also knew about meeting people's needs and doing what it takes. There were at least a dozen pharmacies that were burned down or closed in the wake of the unrest. And initially, I heard comments like, well, what's the big deal? because there are other pharmacies in the city that people can go to. That's fine for you and me. We can write our own prescriptions and transfer these, these prescriptions and drive to another pharmacy. But imagine if you're an 80 year old who's dependent on oxygen, who's in a wheelchair and who needs Medicaid transportation and now that's shut down and your one pharmacy is closed and you don't even have a phone. How are you going to get your prescriptions to be filled? And so we ended up setting up a 24 seven medication access line for people to call and we would get the prescriptions to them for seniors who are in buildings that did not even, um, that were in particularly affected areas. We went door to door in these areas to ask about what needs people had. And when they came up with needs like banking and food 
and supplies, um, we ended up getting these supplies for people and delivered to their homes. And I give this example because this is an example of how, of just what we know how to do in emergency medicine. We know that so many of people's needs are not immediately reflected in what one might expect that you have to go to people, ask them, and then to meet people where they are. The unrest itself was new. The idea of handling public health during civil unrest was new, but we knew what to do. We've trained for this purpose. We need to trust our training because this is frankly the work that we know how to do every day with confronting unknowns and thriving in the face of difficult challenges. One more example of this, um, I wanna take you back to residency. I was a fourth year resident in the spring of 2013, working at Mass General Hospital, when we heard over the loudspeakers that there were bombs that had detonated at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. And again, we all sprung into action and knew what to do. Um, I look back at this and, you know, I think so many of us, it was not just the Boston Marathon bombings. I mean, all of us in some way have been involved with these mass casualty events. I mean, it's tragic and heartbreaking. And what we're living through with COVID is so heart-wrenching on so many levels. But this is what we are trained to do. It doesn't make it any easier, but it does make all of us as emergency physicians experts in doing what's hard. We are seeing tragedies now in the wake of COVID in a way that none of us could have ever imagined possible. But we are emergency physicians. This is what we are trained to do. This is what we are honored to do in service to our patients every day. And so draw upon our training and recognize how it's prepared us for these challenging moments now and in the future. Lesson number four to the next slide is that we find interventions when we can. There's a parable in public health that's about three friends who are walking along a river that's, fast, that's flowing very quickly. And they begin to see that there are children floating by and these children are drowning. So the first person jumps in and starts rescuing the children one by one, but more and more kids start going by. The second person starts running upstream and sees that there's a dam and tries to repair the dam because if he can repair the dam, that's one way to stop these kids from drowning as well. The third person keeps on running and the first two shout after him, hey, where are you going? Help us now. And the third person says, but I'm trying to see who's throwing in these kids in the first place. Now that parable is often told as an example of going upstream the purpose of public health or one goal in public health is to go as far, as far upstream as possible with the idea that if you can intervene really early and change the trajectory of somebody's life really early and you're able to prevent so many other things downstream that would have to happen. Um, we took, uh, took it upon ourselves to do this in Baltimore. One of the programs I'm the most proud of, for example, is a program that seems very simple. Um, that's called Vision for Baltimore. Um, it's a providing, it provides free glasses and eye exams to every child who needs it in the city, which seems again, very basic, but there was a study done um, right before I got to Baltimore that found that up to 10,000, 10,000 of our school children needed glasses, but were not getting them for a variety of reasons. They were not getting the screening. They had insurance issues. Their parents never knew about their screening results and so forth. And so we partnered with Johns Hopkins, Warby Parker, a number of other organizations to literally do screenings in schools and eye exams and then free glasses provided by Warby Parker. And I remember um, there was a PBS crew actually that came to do a documentary um, about our program. And um, the, I think the producer was hoping to capture this moment when these, these little kids were getting their glasses for the first time. And I think they were hoping to capture the aha moment of, Wow, now I can see. Well, they asked this one girl who had just chosen her little pink frames for the first time and they asked this girl um, if she sees a difference when she puts on her glasses. She was not very impressed and she said, no. So then the producer asked her to read something without her glasses, which she squinted at and really had trouble reading. And then she put on her glasses and read the same thing flawlessly with no pauses. And the producer said, do you see any difference? 
I think was again waiting for this aha thank you moment. And the girl was still not impressed, so she said no. But I was watching, and there was one of our vision screeners who had worked at the health department for over 20 years. She was watching everything unfold from behind the scenes, and she had tears running down her face. I think because she saw what a difference something as simple as a pair of glasses can make. Um, and it could really make the difference for this girl between potentially even advancing grades and not, and, um, and that it could really change the trajectory of her life. Now, I'm not saying that glasses are a panacea to education, but I think it's one example of how something small can make a difference, how this upstream example is something that we should do as much as possible. But I'll add too that for us in emergency medicine, we also have to intervene midstream and downstream too. Because if we are one of these friends who are running along stream, sure, there is the role of somebody who is trying to go far upstream to figure out who's throwing in these kids. But if we see a child who's drowning now, so to speak, it's also our job to intervene now. Someone who is shot, ideally we could have prevented that gunshot in the first place. But if they're shot now, we have to save their life but we also have an in, a chance to intervene to make sure that they don't get shot again. And I say all of this because I think so often when we talk about public health, we think about things that are really far upstream, but we should not forget the importance of these midstream downstream interventions as well. And how as something that seems like a very small intervention is actually what will make a huge difference at the end of the day. In the times of COVID, um, I think so much about patients being alone. And, you know, it's just, it's something that, again, I don't think any of us could have really imagined the idea of patients being critically ill alone, even dying alone. And I'll also think about the small acts that for some patients really mean the world. The small act of connecting someone over FaceTime, um, of using your own phone in some cases to do so. Um, when family members cannot hold someone's hand, again, just I can't even imagine this happening, but that's what we have right now. And if that's the situation that our patients are in, then the small acts that we can take, uh, some of them are big acts. Some of them are saving someone's life and helping them to recover. But the seemingly small acts of connecting someone on the phone to say goodbye one last time, that matters too. You know, my, um, it's May and um, May, and we just had Mother's Day. Um, my mother died about 10 years ago from metastatic cancer. And I remember the day that she passed away. Um, we were in a very busy hospital ward and we did not have our own room. Um, and she was um, about to pass. And I remember there was a nurse who found a curtain because the curtain had actually been broken. She found a piece of curtain and drew the curtain closed and stood in front of that curtain as a way to give us privacy. I will remember that act, that seemingly small act forever. And I think that's the kind of difference that all of us make in our patients' lives every day too. Let me go on to the fifth lesson. And the fifth lesson is to make the invisible visible. There's a saying in public health that public health saved your life today, you just don't know it. And that is the case with, with public health, that so much of the time, the work that we do is invisible. It's behind the scenes. And in fact, we are successful when something did not happen. We may do hundreds of restaurant inspections in order to prevent the one case of foodborne illness that you never knew about because it never happened. Um, the interventions that we have to abate someone's home from lead means that children are never lead poisoned in the first place. And actually, you could say the same thing about emergency medicine, too, that so much of the work that we do is behind the scenes. By the time that someone arrives on the floor in the ICU, we've done all these interventions, and they're all kind of behind the scenes because not everyone is aware of the, all the work that was, that was put into for someone to be stabilized as they are. Well, I think that in the time of COVID, the world is now seeing the work that public health is and also the work that emergency physicians do every single day. And I think about the work and the sacrifice that everyone is making. And by the way, I just have to say some of these sacrifices that emergency physicians are making shouldn't have to happen. I mean, the fact that we are, um, at, at least certainly at the beginning of the outbreak, running out of PPE, 
I mean, I had my classmates from residency email around about what the best way to refashion masks were, how many times you could sanitize a mask, um, whether we could ask other, um, our friends and family to go to Lowe's and Home Depot to buy masks or figure out home improvement um, or, or fashion supplies from home improvement materials, or even go so far as to buy rain ponchos and think about how garbage bags and ski masks can be repurposed. I mean, I know that that's what we had to do. And I'm glad that we were able to do these things and that other people have stepped up to help us at this time. But none of this should have happened. It is actually totally unconscionable that anyone is put into a position where we're trying to protect our patients and we're not allowed to do so. As in, we go into this field knowing that we'll be sacrificing a lot and we go into this field to gladly serve our patients, but we, we should not have to sacrifice our own health and well being. Anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox about this, but just know that this is something that is just totally unacceptable and should really have never happened. But I think as a result, of the lack of PPE as a result of all the, the issues that we're facing with overcrowding and um, lack of ventilators, supply issues and others, we have really heard emergency physicians speak up with clarity and purpose. And in these times where there is rampant disinformation and frankly, a lot of myths and misunderstanding and unclear messages coming out, this is not a political talk, I'm just saying in general, this is a time of a lot of misinformation. Our voice is more important than ever. And it's even more important for all of us to speak with that clarity and purpose and with urgency, compassion, and action. So I'm gonna to end today with a quote by one of my heroes, the late Representative Elijah Cummings, after whom my, my son, my older child is named. Um, Congressman Cummings liked to say that the work that we have ahead of us is bigger than us. It's so much bigger than us that it's about our children and about the generations yet unborn, that our children are messengers to a future that we will never see, and that what we do right now is for them. And this is what we do every day. We focus on our patients, we save lives now, but we also know that it's about safeguarding health and well-being for generations to come. Back to the comment that, we first, um, that I first referred to when I first talked to Dr. Holmes and Dr. Martin, you can always count on emergency physicians. We're always proud to be emergency physicians. We're proud also to be in academic emergency medicine because we're serving our patients and training the future generations. We will always be there, no matter what, in service to our patients and our communities. We as emergency physicians, we don't wait for others to act. We are leaders and we take action now. We as emergency physicians, we don't just talk about service. We're on the front lines serving every day. And we as emergency physicians, we are not waiting for the cavalry because we know that the cavalry is not going to come, that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. So thank you, Dr. Holmes and the entire SAEM leadership for your dedication. Thank you everyone for your exceptional work today and each and every day. And I applaud you, I celebrate you as I fight together and serve together alongside you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen. And thank you again for this timely and insightful and motivational presentation. In a few moments, we will answer questions from the audience. As a reminder, for those who are attending the live session, please send your questions in via the Q&A pop-up window by clicking the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. We will try to get in as many questions as possible in our remaining 15 or so minutes. So while the questions are coming in, I would like to ask Dr. Wynn, what advice would you have for trainees who are interested in policy and advocacy, especially in the current environment? I appreciate the question um, and um, want to say first off that I think a lot of people will answer this question or will think about this question in terms of politics. And certainly running for office is something that you could do if that's something that you want to do. But I think for the majority of us who want to do policy and advocacy, running for office is not necessarily what we might wanna do. And it seems like a pretty high bar just to be involved in policy and advocacy. So I would say there are many other ways to be involved. I would also not necessarily just think about the national level. I think often we think about national level. And again, I think there are many ways to be involved that way um, through SAM, through ASAP, through AAM, through AMA. I mean, through, there are many organizations, um, progressive organizations, mainstream organizations, many ways to be involved in national policies if you want. 
but so much is happening on the local and state level. And I would advise for everyone to be involved with your local and state medical associations if they exist um, um, and, are, and are active. Um, also to be involved with your local health departments, to in get involved with local nonprofits that may really need your voice. And again, right now during these times, your voice is so critical. Don't turn down opportunities. I think this really applies to, to, um, to, to trainees. You know, when I look back at my training, um, the opportunities that turned out to be the most important in my life were opportunities that I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated and actually might have turned down. But I did not say no really to anything during my, my, my training. And I think as a result had wide exposure and also so many of the incredible mentors that I met as a result are because of these opportunities that I didn't say no to. So don't turn down opportunities, try it and, and see. Um, I would also advise to find your voice, which is something that may take some time. Um, you may not know if you're most comfortable with the voice that speaks from the patient perspective that speaks as a physician that then, or that delves more into policy and politics, there are no wrong answers here, but you have to find the best fit for yourself. And I would say, um, finally, to not be afraid to do bold things, to take bold action, knowing that sometimes these things don't work out. Certainly in my career, there have been jobs and opportunities that did not work out nearly as I expected. But as Winston Churchill says, um, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to persist that counts. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Here's a question from Sonia Stokes. Currently, many hospitals and health systems are responding to smaller patient volumes by decreasing hours, shifts, and potentially even cutting the pay of emergency physicians. Many of us who work concurrently in public health see this as a dangerous decision, especially given we are still in the middle or maybe even at the beginning of a pandemic. What policy changes would you recommend for hospitals and health systems regarding staffing that provide short-term solutions that are also not short-sighted? That's a really terrific question. And I worry so much about this too. Um, just before this, um, this, this uh, um, keynote webinar, I was just on the phone with some colleagues in primary care who work for community health centers. And it's kind of unimaginable, right? I think the general public even may not be aware that this is happening. I don't think they are aware. They see these images of frontline providers and think that you know, they're calling pr providers heroes and saying that, oh, wow, you know, hospitals and healthcare is so important at this time. We're thinking about it all the time, but they're not aware that the very people they depend on now are actually potentially facing loss of jobs, loss of pay, and even closure in the case of these primary care health centers, um, potentially even closure of their, um, of their health center that they normally go to for care. I mean, it really is, uh, in a way, it's unimaginable, although we can see how this happened um, with the loss of revenue from elective procedures and other things. I mean, this is one where in addition to what the hospital can do, we really need legislative change. We really, I mean, we need for the funds that come through to really prioritize our healthcare sector. Because I think exactly as, um, as the person who wrote the question said, if we are unable to sustain our healthcare infrastructure now, much less a few months down the line, what are we gonna do when we have a second wave in the fall? What are we gonna do even for all the patients who come in for non-COVID care? Because as we know, healthcare happens during a pandemic. You don't just stop requiring everything else, even if there is a decline in volume for the short-term, healthcare is still happening. So I think that, I mean, I'm not sure what the short-term solutions are for hospitals because I think so, so much will depend on the dynamics and the finances of that particular hospital. But I do think that to the point of the earlier question, this is where our voice at, in, in advocacy is so important. Frankly, right now, while we have the goodwill of our legislators, because people are saying, let's thank our providers. Well, let's show them that we don't just want, you know, jets to be flying overhead. I mean, it's nice. It's nice that people are saluting providers at night, but what we really need are to, is to, first of all, have our personal protective equipment to keep us alive um, and not endanger our families. 
And second, to keep our hospitals and our systems running so that we can continue to treat you into the future. Thank you very much. Here's a question from Martina Caldwell. Do you see the role of public health evolving within emergency medicine specialty in the future, especially as COVID is current on, currently ongoing? It's a good question. Um, I think there is growing awareness in the public of both of these fields of emergency medicine and public health. And I think that at least my view on this, and people may disagree, but my view on this going through training and, and afterwards was that it almost seemed like these were two totally different fields. As an emergency medicine was focused on the one hand on acute care, those like really downstream interventions, and public health was focused on the really upstream interventions on the other end. And they almost didn't overlap. But I think that there is growing awareness about how these two fields actually come together in so many different ways, again, because we are the front lines, um, because we do see the full spectrum of social determinants of health, because we are part of crisis management all in different ways. I think there can be a lot more synergy and understanding. Frankly, I haven't thought ahead enough to know what that exactly might look like, but I do hope that this will spur more people to be interested in both of our fields and potentially also in the intersection of these fields as well. Thank you, that is great. Uh, here's a question from Dan Meyer. You mentioned misinformation that has been happening. What is the public health answer to our fractured society and the all too frequent insertion of false science into the decision-making process? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I'm gonna answer this, but um, in a, in a back to the first question that was asked about policy and advocacy as well, because it's taken me some time to find my voice and the voice that I am the most comfortable with. Um, in medical school, I was an advocate. And then of course I became a physician and then um, was a writer and then worked in policy and then worked in government and then worked in advocacy and then came back. I mean, so it took me a while to find out what is that voice that I am the most comfortable with. And the voice that, and it's an evolving process. It might well change over time um, and over my, my career too. But the voice that I'm the most comfortable with speaking, especially at this time in our history, is as the voice of a physician whose information is based in, and advocacy is firmly grounded in science, evidence, and facts. Um, and to that point, um, and to, to this particular question about what is our role and how we can do it, people can do it in different ways. I know that for myself, I want to answer the disinformation with facts. So as, as an example, I was on CNN, actually right after um, President Trump made comments about injecting disinfectants. And um, I was on a, um, a panel where there were other people who were saying, you know, who are political folks and advocates who were saying things that deliberate, that were, you know, that were talking about um, what this means for politics. And you can imagine the kind of the partisan comments that people could be making. Yes, I could have added my voice to that, but I actually thought that where my voice is the strongest and perhaps where many of our voices is the strongest is to state the facts, to say unequivocally, do not inject or ingest disinfectants um, because that will result in people getting very sick and could, and could potentially die, right? I mean, we can speak and say, we have seen patients come into the EDs who have done these things and it's obviously not a safe thing to do and here's why. There are plenty of people who can speak with the political voice and say, um, and again, you know, I'm not saying that these are wrong. There should be people speaking with whatever voice they want to use. And if that's the voice that you're comfortable with, that's fine too. But I think that one of the strongest counters to disinformation and myths and other things at this time is to be the credible truth teller. Think about Dr. Tony Fauci right now. He has the trust of the public because he is apolitical, because he is speaking with the voice of science and truth. When he doesn't know something, he says he doesn't know something. He's humble. He talks about, um, about he's very clear about what he knows, what he doesn't. And I think being able to speak with that voice of science and truth and evidence is what we have in our favor. And we should lean into that as a way to counter disinformation at this time. Yes, very good point. Uh, here's a question from Sarah Hawk. For emergency physicians with limited public health experience, 
Can you recommend a starting point to help us gain appropriate experience to offer assistance to the public health organizations you suggested earlier could use our help? That's an interesting question. Um, so I actually think that you have a lot more public health experience than you know, um, simply by being on the front lines and working essentially in the public health system, even though we don't necessarily call it that. I never thought about it in my training as I'm actually part of the public health system, but that's what the emergency department for better or, or for worse actually is. So I think you actually know a lot more than you may think. I mean, so much of the work that we do in public health, kind of the bread and butter of public health are infectious illnesses and STIs. I mean, that's what we do in the EDs all the time. We do emergency preparedness and response. That's what we do in EDs all the time. I mean, so I actually think that you know and are steeped in it a lot more than than uh, than you might think. Um, I am a um, I'm a nerd in some ways, and so love reading. I would recommend reading some good public health books. Um, there was a, a a book called Saving Gotham. Um, that was written by the former health commissioner of New York City, who is now the health commissioner in um, in in um, in in Philadelphia. Um, that's very good. Um, there's the book that was written by the pediatrician who um, um, who who unearthed many of the problems with the Flint water crisis, Mona Hanna Atisha. That's also very good. Um, that what the eye can't see. I'm I'm not googling at the same time. And so, but Mona Hanna Atisha's book and then the book called Saving Gotham, I think, are great books that I think can that people can relate to very easily. And I think that you can see also how your experience in emergency medicine really ties to public health. And then on the practical level, I would say, um, don't turn down opportunities to partner with your local health department or local community-based organizations. They will really want and need your help. Um, and so feel free to offer your, your assistance. And, um, and I would also say, if you offer your assistance, don't demand a project. That was one of the issues that I had as the health commissioner that I had many people come to me saying, I have this very specific niche expertise and I want to do a project in this. Well, I don't have time to be matchmaker for a hundred people who may have great areas of expertise, but if I don't have that need right now, I can't use your expertise. And so I think if you approach your local health department or community-based organization offering to help in general with whatever they might need, I'm sure that they will come up with something, if not now, then into the future too. Thank you, very good advice. Here's a question from Chris Carpenter. You talked about patients being alone. Hospitals across the country have created no visitor policies for suspected COVID patients without exceptions. These policies are particularly detrimental for older adults with dementia who rel rely upon family caregivers to reduce incident delirium when hospitalized. How do you see this evolving in the future? I mean, this is, of all things, is maybe the most heartbreaking part of, of, of COVID. I mean, you know, people may have different thoughts about this, but I, I just can't really imagine. I think as someone who has gone through various end of life scenarios, I, I mentioned with, with, with my mother um, personally. Also, um, I recently gave birth. Um, I have a five week old. And so um, was in a situation where, you know, I, I was lucky uh, my, my hospital at the end ended up allowing my husband to be with me during labor and delivery. But I actually thought that it was possible to be without my husband during a trying time. This is not you know, end of life, but it's also a trying time in people's lives. And I think a, a time when we could not have expected who would have expected to be giving birth alone um, um, just a few months ago. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I have so much sympathy and empathy, I think, for people who are in this kind of situation now, as the patient, as the as the as the caregiver. Um, you know, I had co-written a book um, about patient advocacy, and one of the key principles is you should always have someone with you in that time, and to not be able to do that is again just unimaginable. Now, I'm not sure at what point our hospitals will be able to change that that kind of policy. I imagine that having adequate PPE and having widespread testing those are going to be important components to getting to the point that there can be someone um, who accompanies patients. We're not really there in, um, in either of those two standpoints. Um, I could imagine too, potentially, if we have serological testing, um, if at some point we can confirm that immunity does in fact occur, I mean, I could imagine scenarios where this policy will change. But in the meantime, the advice that I've been giving patients, not just for end of life or you know anything, but just in general for patients is, 
make sure to come prepared with lists of your, your medications, your healthcare proxy information, your provider information, make sure that you have your electronic device and on speed dial, you can figure out very quickly and show you the, the providers who are there with you um, very quickly who to call to be with you um, while, uh, while, while you're in the hospital. And I'm afraid that you know this is, the, this is part of the new normal that is just, again, one of the most heartbreaking things that we're living with. Yeah, agreed. Very tough uh, issue right now. Uh, here's a question from Elisa Hayes. You talked about finding interventions when we can. What types of methods are out there or can you think of for community outreach to tell patients that coming to the ED is safe? What sort of communications do you think would work best for this since many ED volumes are, uh, are down quite low right now? You know, um, our messaging at the beginning of this outbreak seems to have worked too well because I remember at the beginning um, of COVID nineteen, and I did this too, right? I mean, um, when we saw that there, when we saw that there would likely be very high volumes of patients coming in, we said to people, stay home, um, don't come to the ED. Of course, we, we never said that to patients with acute issues, but we said if you're not going to come, what I said was that if you're not going to come to the ED. Um, if you were not going to come to the ED already, don't come because you want to get a COVID test, because you could be exposed to coronavirus there, because they're, um, because we're not going to get a test for you anyway, et cetera. And I think that as a result, we had a lot of patients who were potentially too scared to come in and get tested, understandably so, um, because in part because of our messaging that we put out. I think that the messaging um, needs to be multiple uh, components. I do think that we need to put out the messaging as much as we can in the media. We need to have trusted messengers put this out in the community as well. So again, community-based organizations, public health departments, um, and I think data will be helpful too. So if you can say um, our average wait time used to be, I'm making this up, three hours, but now you can be seen in 20 minutes. I think if you really, if you wanted to do that, those types of data and points will be useful in getting, in having patients have the confidence to come back. I do think that ultimately what will give patients the confidence to come back is actually the confidence of having COVID under control. And so the more that we can also talk about the protocols that we have in place to protect patients um, and, um, and eventually hopefully actually getting the protocols or getting, um, uh, ensuring safety for, for patients too, I think that will also be important. So the messaging also accompanies the actions before. All right, that is the last question we have time today. Thank you again to Dr. Wen for sharing your incredible stories and for helping the rest of the country care, prepare just a little bit better for the COVID-19 pandemic at their own hospitals and communities. Dr. Rothman, do you have any final remarks? Yeah, so just a final comment. I just wanted to thank Dr. Wen. She, when I asked her if she would do this presentation, she jumped immediately. Um, and I think she gives a great message of um, uh, courage, leadership, and uh, optimistic vision um, for, for, for the society. Um, her, her vision uh, strongly echoes that of another leader, Barack Obama, and basically saying that as emergency physicians, we can't wait for another person or some other time to make a difference. We have to recognize within ourselves, both individually and as a collective, that we're a path forward for responding and that we can and will make a difference for uh, navigating that path forward, both for our, our patients and for the health of the public. So thank you so much, Dr. Wen. We really appreciate and value all of your insights and optimistic vision forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Rothman. Thank you again to Dr. Wynn and Dr. Rothman. We truly appreciate your time.